2022 is coming to an end and it has not really been a great year. There has been, there have been wars and fighting, fears of nuclear confrontation, hotspots and conflicts taking place across the world. Over the past year, we have brought you many of these issues in various episodes of Mapping Fault Lines, talking about what happens beyond the headlines. Today, we are going to be looking at five or six crucial topics that have defined the year and whose importance will continue in the coming year as well. Stay tuned. We're joined by Prabir Prakashtha. Prabir, so a lot to discuss in this special episode. There are so many hotspots, so many conflict zones. But let's talk about the one that's on the minds of everybody right now, has been on the minds of everyone for the whole year because the issue started the year before, that's Ukraine. Now, first of all, I mean, we of course have stayed away from talking about battlefield nitty-gritty and nuances. But broadly for the benefit of our viewers, where do we stand now as far as the fighting and you know the confrontation is concerned on the ground in a general sense before we go on to some of the larger political issues. Well, clearly the war continues and we have no end date for the war from either side. So the, nobody is looking as of date to sit down and talk about what could be a peace plan. Russians have said that yes, we have certain conditions. Ukraine has given conditions. Neither side's conditions at the moment are acceptable to each other. Right. Also, NATO's involvement in the war, and the, we have always said that this is not a war between Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. but a larger war of NATO against Russia, right. trying to weaken it eastward march towards Russia. So if we take all that into account, that still continues. NATO's involvement in Ukraine is actually growing, not right. reducing. Absolutely. If we talk about now the Patriot battle, uh, batteries going there, billion dollars or something, the huge budget uh, allocation now has been made for the Ukraine, very mm -hmm. clear mm -hmm. that the United States and its allies are staying the course for now, mm -hmm. irrespective of its crisis that is taking place in Europe. Right. Looking at the battlefield, as you've asked, mm -hmm. the battlefield is that, well, Russia has increased, obviously, the occupied zone. If you take February as a start of uh, the really the armed uh, missions that Russia sent, what is it, special military operations. Right. If you take that, then it has expanded what was the Donbass uh, territory, which had seized control from Ukraine, of course, with uh, possibly Russian support, but they were having the independent republics of Donetsk, and, Don Donetsk. Donetsk and Lugansk. So that territory under the control of Russia or Russian allies in Ukraine has grown significantly. So now it's gone to Kherson. There is Mariupol, all those areas have been mm -hmm. taken. So if you look at the larger geostrategic picture, Crimea headwaters are under control, so they don't have to drink only bottled water, which is what they were being forced to do. So that, that part has opened up. The headwaters of the uh, river are there from which they can get direct supplies. Crimea is physically connected, apart from the Kirsch Bridge, right. is physically connected via Mariupol and the other areas. So you have a continuity which is Donbass to Crimea now. So it does appear that the Azov Sea is under the control, Black Sea, they are stronger, that if we look at this as the limited area, military target they had, that Russia is more or less in right. control of. What is the future? That's an important question. What is the Russian larger goal that may, might be there? And what is the NATO's goal? Those are really the key questions. Right. So, Prabir, of course, one of the things you always talked about is the fact that how this is not really purely a military operation. There's also an energy war. There's a financial war that has taken place. And this year has been interesting that way because we've seen the sanctions, which really didn't have the effect. We've seen a lot of politics about energy. So, as 2022 comes to an end, finance and energy, where do we stand on these being used as weapons in, uh, in a conflict like this? Well, you know, before we do that, I would also like to say that it is unfortunate the war is actually expanding. Because if you see, now you have regular bombing of electrical infrastructure mm. of Ukraine, which means large parts of Ukraine will not have electricity for heating, right. lighting, and so on, which is a tragedy because winters are very harsh in Ukraine. And this, this has happened over the last two, three months. Earlier, Russia was not attacking the infrastructure. It started really with the Kirsch Bridge attack, after which they seem to have started much larger assault on the infrastructure. The Ukraine nationalism, 
which is something which was relatively uh, not so sharp, has certainly gained uh, energy right. and swung much more to the right. We have clearly the neo fascist forces becoming far more active and uh, visible today in Ukraine. The third part of it, which is where the dangers might lie for Ukraine, is that Ukraine is losing a huge amounts of soldiers on the battlefield in Bakhmut, for instance, which is really uh, becoming a bit of a meat grinder. And Russia doesn't seem to be too interested in territory at the moment as the destruction of military forces of Ukraine, which is one of the targets that they had demilitarized Ukraine. Right. So that they seem to be achieving in this way. And the fact that NATO, coming to the NATO question, NATO's huge investment that is taking place in the war, not only in shoring up the Ukrainian economy, which is one of the major tasks they have, they have had, but also the fact they're pouring in huge amounts of weaponry over there. And it seems now with the uh, Patriot uh, batteries coming in, that the risk of widening the war is there on one hand. Other hand, it's really NATO forces literally on the ground to support these kind of advanced weapons, which the Ukrainians have not been trained right. on. So there is the greater risk of this spinning out of control. At the moment, NATO is certainly not winning this war. Mm -hmm. If you take Russia's task is to demilitarize Ukraine, may weaken it, that seems to be happening on the ground. At the same time, Ukrainian nationalism has also risen, shall we say, much further. Right. It's that, that way it is much sharper today than it was earlier. So peace immediately is not on the cards unless European Union Behave, you know, starts putting its uh, what is happening to it on the table and thinking about it. That is your really the other question. What is the NATO's larger prospects right. and what is the European U Union doing? The energy war and the economic war. Leaving the economic war out, the energy war clearly has hit European Union much harder than it has hit Russia. Right. Russia's still supplies to the world market continues. This uh, so called cap, energy cap, doesn't seem to be working because anyway the oil prices have not gone that high. The gas prices for Europe, European Union, has been much higher because LNG is four to five times higher than what the pipe gas they were getting earlier. Mm -hmm. And the net gainer has been some of the oil kingdoms, right. but also the United States, right. who even now in uh, Germans and others have been saying, well, you know, we are paying five times what our pipe gas price was when you were paying it to Russia, United States. They're asking us to do a lot of things, but they're gaining out of it. Absolutely. So European Union seems to be the net loser in this conflict, mm -hmm. apart from Ukraine. Right. United States, net gainer, because they are having their uh, control over Western Europe make even stronger at the moment, and also getting them in the grip for the future for the energy supplies. Right. So United States seems to be a net gainer, but at what cost? Because strategically, they have strengthened Russia's military uh, machine. They have strengthened Russia's actual influence in the world because nobody was willing to cut apart from the handful of countries with NATO willing to cut uh, their terms, economic ties with Russia and impose sanctions. Right. So I think net, the, I don't think Russia has been at least a loser mm -hmm. in that terms, unlike European Union, which has been a loser. Absolutely. What is the geostrategic picture in the future? Again, crystal ball. That's, That's not an easy <laughs> answer to give. But yes, Russia survived, its economy survived, and its energy external uh, trade has survived. At the moment, Russia seems to be economically stronger than it was earlier. European Union net loser. United States, I will say it's a net gainer, gainer right. economically mm -hmm. because European industries also seem to be wanting to shift to the United States right. because of cheaper energy. Absolutely. So given that, politically, what's going to happen to European Union is the key question for the future as much as what, when will Ukraine and Russia sit down and discuss an agreement. That depends really on the European Union at the moment because the U.S. is very clear. It will like to fight... Continue this as long as possible. As long as possible, weakening Russia. You fight right, uh, uh, Russia to the last Ukrainian. But what happens to the European economy? And the fact that now European, Europeans are talking to Chinese, then we also come to the... We have to look at the second 
battlefield, battlefield in, exactly, or which is the front lines, right. which is the one with China. Absolutely, right. So, Prabir, that's a good segue into this question because that was a moment which everyone was really nervous about. Nancy Pelosi deciding to land in Taiwan, you know, speculation building up for weeks, a lot of tension because of the fact that both the US and China are uh, nuclear powers. At one level, on the other hand, it was quite puzzling the rhetoric around it, especially over the one China issue. We do know that the US is committed technically to the one China policy, but Biden making statements indicating that they would defend Taiwan. So all this put together, where do we see, you know, why is this, why has Taiwan become such a key point right now? Because we've seen the trade war in the past years, but this year specifically, why did Taiwan become such a flashpoint? <coughs> You know, simply put, the U.S. would like in the long run to detach Taiwan completely. Internal politics of Taiwan, they had a government which was much more stridently anti-People's Republic of China than the earlier governments were. Right. They haven't done so well in the last Taiwanese yeah, election. Yeah, they lost quite badly. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting <clears throat> that the ones who are the uh, one China people in Taiwan are the ones also the followers of Chiang Kai-shek. Okay, so they're not friendly with the, the PRC, but they at the same time, they believe that it should be one China. Mm -hmm. And this, they, this is the complex scenario which we have to negotiate. If we look at uh, just, uh, Taiwan, it's also which NATO equivalent in Western Europe or Europe, there is this equivalent in, uh, in the East Asia uh, region that this can be a springboard if you want to hem in China. Strategically, you have Taiwan, you have Japan, you have South, South Korea. Korea. Then if you come down, you used to have Philippines, which may have returned to the United States with the victory of the Marcos, Bong Bong Marcos. Young, young Marcos. So that's a possibility. We'll keep that as a possibility. It's not so easy for Philippines to go there as yet. So how to hem China in? Now, if you see the way the world portrays it, as if the United States is somewhere close to Taiwan, Taiwan is in between PRC, uh, People's Republic of China, and uh, Taiwan. So somewhere Taiwan is equidistant, if you look the at the readers, <laughs> for the US readers particularly, that it's really somewhere in between the two. The reality is that it is only 80, 100 kilometers off the shore of PRC. The so-called uh, air defense zone that it def def says, warning and defense zone it claims, is over the PRC, <laughs> it's the People's Republic of China, it's over that. So if you take China as a state and take United States, obviously the island of Taiwan over which this discussion is taking place is really a part of very close to PRC. Right. Therefore, United States, its warships coming over there, its aircraft coming over there, nuclear capable uh, submarines coming over there is really a projection of naval power across the entire Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. into the mainland of Asia. Right. And that's what it's really about, that we have to control China. In order to control China, we have to control the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. particularly the near Pacific, which is what Taiwan, Korea, and Japan is. So right. that is why the military power projection, that's why Taiwan becomes a conflict issue. Because that way you can actually say, okay, we are controlling you because your shoreline, your shoreline is under our guns. Absolutely. So this is the old, uh, shall we say, the gunboat gun diplomacy boat. that the United States believes. More of gunboat, less of diplomacy. Though. Less of <laughs> diplomacy. But it is backed up by the really the economic war. Economic war that exactly. is, I think, the crux of the issue mm -hmm. between China and the United States. Not so much the uh, United States and you, China is not so much Taiwan as it is about the economic right. dominance. Right. Who will dominate not the Pacific, but the world economy. The world economy. And in this context, probably it's interesting that China also seems to have its own set of options, which is where, for instance, Southeast Asia comes into play, which is where that whole region. So while the United States has been pushing you know, a very security-driven uh, policy or narrative for that matter. China's approach seems to be very different to these countries. So although they do have differences, China and many of these countries, nonetheless, there's this attempt 
to sort of work together. We saw that, for instance, in Bali when Xi Jinping went there as well. So, does that seem like a good counterweight to what the U.S. is trying? Well, you know, the, the view of the world is very different if you are sitting in Asia or Africa mm. or if you are sitting in America or Western Europe. They seem to view, particularly the United States, control over the oceans to control the world, while the Eurasian landmass, most of the people there would see, well, you know, there are other options that we can think about. So if you take that into account, then China has been talking about the Belt Road Initiative as how to unite the Eurasian landmass. They have been also talking about the Maritime Silk Route, right. which is maybe a discussion for another day. But it's clear that with the Western Front being NATO and Ukraine and Russia, with the Eastern Front being Taiwan, that's the way the United States is projecting it, but also Japan and South Korea. Then you are looking at the whole of Eurasian landmass. I'm going to minus South Asia out of it because we have the Himalayas, so it's not really similar. So the integration economically of Eurasia, is it possible? And that, now Russia and China on the same side, this is what the U.S. has done with the two major strategic moves it has made, one in Ukraine and the eastward march of NATO, and the other in Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, particularly Taiwan. So you've really got two of this the two of the biggest right. countries in the region together. And of course, the sanctions that you have imposed in China. So economically, this China's interest is really expanding trade ties in which also Africa, Latin America also fall in. You have raised about the Southeast Asia. It's a very important issue. One is on the South China Sea, though the United States say they are intervening in favor of these countries, which are littoral states of South China Sea, apart from China, their interest and the interests of the littoral states are very different. Right. Because the other, all the states have said, we do not consider this to be free and open seas. This is really our, basically, uh, economic zone. Zones, so. And the exclusive economic zone, where the lines lie, that is the dispute Western with China. Right. But that is there, all of that put them put together, that's an exclusive economic zone, which United States cannot regard as open seas. That is the position. On the question of economic integration that you were talking about through trade, which is what China has been also talking about, the question is the United States had the opportunity for a trans-Pacific partnership, partnership uh, the TPP. Yes. But instead of that, it withdrew from that and therefore left no alternative for countries like Japan, but to be a part of what is now a much larger trade block, the largest trade block, what is it called? RCEP the largest trade block, which is RCEP, which has China in it, Japan in it, and Southeast Asian countries in it. India is also not there. So there is no counterbalance to China over there. And that is the biggest trade block in the world today, right. which is also growing. So given that Southeast Asian countries do not want it, they're the fastest growing zone in the world today. They do not want their trade to be disturbed by these kind of economic wars. So I think that's the other major factor to be taken into account. As far as Central Asia is concerned, again, one side Russia, one side Iran, the other side uh, China. If you look at the map, it's very clear that the Central Asia's interests lie more in these three major countries, Absolutely. particularly China being a much more right. uh, bigger economic partner. So given that, I don't think, you know, isolating China in this way, we can again talk about the technology war. Maybe it's a topic for another day. But I don't think in geostrategic terms, they, the United States is going to make a headway by just roping in three of its allies, South Korea, Japan, and now impending one of Taiwan, if they succeed in getting the Taiwanese to completely go with them. I don't think that's a really a viable option for them. So a lot of it will hinge upon the energy war with Russia right. and also the economic war, the, particularly the technology war with China, which of course is a much larger topic. Absolutely. Right. Right, Prabhupada, you mentioned Iran. This takes us really to uh, one of the other topics we come regularly to the show, which is West Asia. Again, this year we've seen a lot happening. The Iran nuclear deal stuck in a limbo. Even now, Biden apparently said that you know it's a dead deal. And of course, we've seen uh, some interesting developments in terms of Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries putting up 
a slightly different position from the US. There's always, of course, the Israeli occupation of Palestine, Israel becoming a more right-wing, more aggressively right-wing state. But uh, I think one of the things I'd like to start with is the issue of the OPEC plus countries because it connects to our earlier issues as well, which is that, you know, you have Saudi Arabia and all its allies. Everyone for the longest time saw them as proxies, literal proxies of the US. But now it doesn't look so black and white in terms of how things stand. So uh, what exactly is happening that has prompted this kind of realignment? To, if you can call it a realignment. I think it is a larger realignment, part of a larger realignment, mm -hmm. not switching over, flipping from the United States to China or Russia. That's not the way it is happening. It's a really a larger realignment that is taking place. And you're, you're rightly raising the question of OPEC or the oil issue. Mm -hmm. And the oil issue, if... G7 can impose cap on oil price for Russia. It can do it for anybody tomorrow. Right. So therefore, the interest of oil producing countries minus the Russia, Americans, and Americans really produce much more for themselves, right. is not in alignment with the United States. And I think that comes out when you see Saudi Arabia moving towards a more independent position. Also, with Russia is a part of the OPEC continuing what should be the amount of oil they should produce. They did not increase oil production when the production when the United States want. They even now are deciding independently of the US how much oil they should produce. Right. So it's more a declaration of independence from the United States rather than switching side from one to the other. So the Arab countries also, in fact, uh, when uh, Xi Jinping went to Saudi Arabia, there is a Gulf Council meeting, but there's also a meeting with the Arab states, right. which most of the Arab states uh, attended, barring one or two. So given that, there is a larger realignment taking place in, among the Arab states, particularly the oil-rich ones who mm. want then to play a more independent role in the world, and particularly with respect to oil. Yeah. The key, shall we say, producing money producing machine. So not only oil, I'm including also LNG in LNG. this, which is, of course, Qatar comes in a big way on that. So given this realignment, I will say this is more a hydrocarbon independence rather than independence of uh, anything else. Right. Yes, Iran is outside this at the moment, mm -hmm. though Iran is very much a part of the oil producing, gas producing countries. It's still outside it. And Iran has conflict both with Israel, which you have mentioned, but also with Saudi Arabia with respect to Yemen. Mm -hmm. So those things still continue. So internal battles amongst the Arab states is going to continue continue. The conflict with Iran is still very much there between Saudi Arabia and Iran, particularly with respect to Yemen. We don't know what the what course it will take in the future. But those are the unknowns over here. The real issue is, of course, the joker in the pack is, of course, Israel. Right. And the fact with Ben Gavir in a partnership with, the, with Netanyahu. Netanyahu and holding a much stronger hand now has also got essentially the control of the Inter the police, essentially, what in India would be called the home ministry. Mm -hmm. So they are controlling the internal security. And therefore, uh, uh, this means a far more difficult proposition for the pa Palestinians and also those Palestinians who are citizens of uh, Israel, but really second-class citizens. And they'll be told they're second-class citizens in no uncertain terms okay. when Gavir is a partner of this government. So the prospects of peace in Palestine, Israel looks bleak at the moment. That is the worsening of the relationship. Iran has not been happy with China's visit to uh, Saudi Arabia. They've mm -hmm. made some noises about this. So we'll have to see what that course takes place. But the way the United States hates Iran, the fact that it did not come to any agreement with them, means that Iran's therefore will have to still uh, play ball with Russia and with China right. to be able to save itself from the isolation which the United States would like to impose on them, mm -hmm. particularly now that this protests have taken place exactly. like of the women, a large-scale protest against the uh, hijab, and uh, the, essentially the morality, morality police, which is really an oppressive force. So given all of that, Iran, I think, uh, will have to come to terms with the realignment taking place in the region. And I don't think it's going to be at the expense of Iran because China and Russia both want to see Iran as a major player in Central Asia, Absolutely. which is 
the place where Iran has a uh, much bigger stake. Iran as well as Turkey have a much bigger stake. The only ones which have a bigger stake is really Russia and China. Right. Prabir, this, uh, we're moving to the other last two regions that we really need to focus on. And one is, of course, Africa, very diverse continent, very difficult to you know, encompass it in one or two questions. But I think one process we really need to sort of uh, look at, you know, keep emphasizing is what is happening in West Africa, the former, or what is called the Francophone Africa. We have countries like Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, for instance, where this year saw a huge amount of change. The French really losing all credibility, uh, popular protests taking place, coups happen, quite a few coups took place as well. So how do we understand what has been happening in this region? Because uh, I think it's one of those areas we really don't talk about much because of lack of information, language, etc. But it seems to be one of the most important processes taking place in the world. Well, you know, Africa is one of the most important uh, places in the world, has always been. Uh, unfortunately, because of the destructive impact of West European uh, slavery, imperialism, colonialism, dividing Africa, the, what's called the rush for Africa and so on, uh, West, the, uh, Africa still is an embattled continent, right. trying to still rebuild its economy after the colonists have avowedly left. But as we know from the France impact on Africa, they've never really left. If you take the British, they were really replaced gradually by the Americans. Mm -hmm. The French also are being replaced by the Americans with the number of military bases over there. But the French influence post you know, uh, Second World War was still significant in uh, mm -hmm. Africa. And they have had a number of military interventions in Africa coups, toppling governments. This has been their regular course for a very long time. Uh, so this, this is a decisive moment in which France is visibly losing out. Right. Uh, it still controls the economies of Francophone Africa, countries which are in two of the uh, blocks which uh, still currencies maintain also. currencies are basically pegged to the franc. Their, their budgets are passed by the French National Assembly. So given that, I think you will see a much more open assertion of military strength by the United States and a withdrawal of the, of the French. But that also is becoming unpopular mm -hmm. because they are all seen to be ex-colonial, pro-colonial powers. And therefore, now you are seeing a much more uh, assertion of national uh, identities by these countries. We are, of course, because of the way this country's borders were decided, sitting on a map somewhere in Europe drawing lines, uh, then the identities of these countries have to reform, right. not as groups of people, language of uh, different languages. There is that basis isn't there. So they have to reform on the basis of whatever identity they have, because they can't go back to a pre-colonial identity. That is gone. So this is the difficult process of decolonization they are overcoming at the moment, trying to work out their own identities and their own terms with the rest of the world. Their major economic shift has been the trade with China and the infrastructure China is helping them build. That's why the hatred for China by the Western power saying, oh, they are trying to do what we did earlier. <laughs> we have learned, but they have it. They are doing the same thing. But if you look at that, they're building infrastructure. They're not putting their com companies, not military, bases, huh? military bases, or you know, uh, having their trade terms tilted, maybe if in favor of China, but not owning property over there. So this arguments, even if they're true, which is debatable, but you don't see what you saw earlier, that uranium mines, coal mines, gold mines, oil, all the being owned by American or European companies. That you don't see. So given that, I think the issue is really to what extent the imperial powers will let them do this without disturbing the, the, the trajectory they are on. And DRC is the D Democratic Republic of Congo is the key test because that is where the ma a very major wealth of Africa lies. And if that can be redistributed among the ex-colonial powers, including the United States, then that's a big price thereafter. Right. That is why you see M23, mm -hmm. you see Rwanda being used as a uh, force projection by the colonial or ex-colonial American power to see that DRC is kept in check so that its wealth can still continue to be looted. And this is again a discussion another day, what happened in Congo, what did Belgium do, etc. Uh, 
Okay. Not a question today. But that's really the test. And of course, what you said, Francophone Africa, can it assert its identity outside the influence of France, which right. is what the bet battle today is about in this region. Absolutely. And Prabir, one last small bit about the Horn of Africa as well. We know that a civil war was going on in Ethiopia for the longest time. The Ethiopian government versus the Tigray People's Liberation Front. There seems to have been a ceasefire towards the end of the year. Most analysts saying that it took place because the TPLF was pretty much completely defeated in battle. Many analysts also saying that the TPLF was essentially a front for US interests in the region as well. So we have Ethiopia, of course, and Somalia, both of which facing their own crisis, and both of which are also seen as key points of US intervention in the region. Yes, if you take the map of Africa, you will see that uh, the waterways is what the United States and the colonial powers want to control. Therefore, the countries in which they wanted coups, Somalia is one of them, Ethiopia is another country which they're interested in. They control the horns of Africa, therefore the Red Sea. Now, given that as the, as the basis, uh, Ethiopia and Somalia have always been on their target. And Ethiopia, as you know, uh, Tigray, Liber Tig Tigray uh, Liberation. Liberation Front yes. has been a key element of that. Whatever is happening in the region, I'm not going to say A is better than B and C is worse than uh, D and so on. But the point is that much larger representative forces are coming to the fore. And militarily, unfortunately, the U.S. is still a destabilizing force mm -hmm. doing you know, st military strikes in Somalia time and again without any consciousness of what is the emerging political reality that can take place. They would prefer that Somalia lives in this kind of military uh, wilderness and so that they can keep control, that it doesn't become a political power. So this is a very destructive course that you see that's taking place in this region. Hope, if Ethiopia stabilizes, then the next question is what happens to Somalia? These are the two major questions and no easy answers on this question. Absolutely. Right. And Rabir, finally, our last uh, region might be a bit, of a, bit, a bit more of a positive note maybe to end this discussion, which is Latin America. Uh, we did talk last year about so many of these processes that are taking place. And now by the end of the year, we have Colombia, we have Honduras, we have Brazil with Lula. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, in Bolivia. Boric in Chile, again, elected last year, of course, but still nonetheless making, making some inroads. Uh, on the other hand, we do have Peru where we see that President Pedro Castillo was overthrown in the legislative coup, which means these forces, the right-wing forces, are still very much in the fray, so to speak. But I would say that 2022 was a year when Latin America at least saw uh, quite a bit of a shift. Now, it may not have been the same as the pink tide from the early part of the century, but definitely very different from how the continent looked in 2018 or 19. Yes, I think there has been a leftward shift. More than a leftward sh shift, we see a weakening of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you take simply the oil part, Saudi Arabia is gone. Venezuela had gone earlier. Okay, uh, The other Arab countries are gone. So you already see that the oil, at least one major international commodity, that still is at the moment out of the U.S. ability to control. Brazil is very crucial in this also because Brazil is also a metro state. They have a lot of oil resources. They have also hydroelectric resources, but they have also a lot of oil. So this is one resources, if that is what is at, at stake. A resource issue, of course, is also Bolivia, lithium. Right. So therefore, batteries. So that, that is also now firmly on, or has gone to the other side. So yes, shifts. There is also the counter shift, as you put it, at the end of the year. We had a uh, coup in uh, Peru. But we also had the uh, Argentina issue come up. The vice president has been, again, uh, lawfare, again. lawfare argument, which is what was used against Lula. So all these things are there. But I don't see strengthening of the United States influence in Latin America anymore because it's really a rear guard battle mm -hmm. that the United States is fighting how to control Latin America. That seems to be the issue. And even Mexico, right at its borders, right at its borders, also saying things which is unthinkable to the United States 10 years, 15 years back. Right. So what you are seeing in a larger regional assertion 
which a part of it is led by the left, but the process of larger regional assertion, I think that is going to continue. And that is where the United States and the G7 are facing their biggest challenge. Can they dictate to the rest of the world what is it called? The rule-based international right. order right. where they get to make the rules right. and everybody else is to obey them. Right. That I think that is the biggest crisis they are facing, that 2022 is the year which we can say decisively the rule-based international order which started to be asserted when Soviet Union fell post-1990s. This was the slogan under which, if you remember, Serbia was invaded, all of that. That that has come to an end and maybe a true international law-based order in return can take place. And there, of course, the Security Council of the United Nations, whether the U.S. and its allies will let them play that role or not, is the key question for the future, hoping that we do not destroy civilization. Right. Because this year, neither on global warming Absolutely. or on nuclear disarmament, mm -hmm. we have seen not only a decisive step, but we have actually seen a step, retrograde step mm -hmm. taking place. And I think that remains, for the larger 22, the biggest failure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir, for talking to us. That's a lot. I think we have covered two important points you mentioned. One, the threat of civilization, but two, also the weakening or the holes that are being increasingly found in the rules-based international order. Always great to have discussions in Mapping Fault Lines because I think we try to go beyond personalities and statements and pronouncements, look at technology, production, some of the key processes that go over years and decades, and then understand the world through that lens. So thank you once again. And that is all we have today and for this year. We'll be back again in 2023 with new episodes of Mapping Fault Lines, new attempts to explain the world to you in a way that is different from what we often see in the media. Until then, keep watching this click.